start myself? So, hello everybody. Um, I'm Alan Abbey, the Media and Internet Director at the Shalom Hartman Institute here in Jerusalem, and I want to welcome you to the third of our series of rabbinic webinars this year. Tonight's subject is Pesach, Passover, and with me is Dr. Rachel Korazim, and the title of her program is Exploring Passover Through Contemporary Israeli Poetry. Um, I will tell you a little bit about Dr. Korazim in a second, for those of you who do not know, but I just want to remind you in advance that in about a month, on April 25th, we will do our final rabbinic webinar of the season on the subject of Yom Ha'atzma'ut with uh, Dr. Ruth Calderon, who, again, someone I think many of you know. So any of the rabbis on, who are watching today who have been to our programs here in Israel, I think will know Dr. Korazim, who has lectured at Hartman summer programs for many years. But for those of you who don't, and to give her the kavod that she deserves, I will read you just a little bit about her very long and extensive uh, resume. So uh, Rachel Korazim has lectured many times at Hartman Institute summer programs. She is a Jewish education consultant. She specializes in curriculum development for Holocaust and Israel education. She was academic director of distance learning programs at the Jewish Agency, and so she is quite uh, expert at uh, presenting programs on uh, television and on uh, the internet. She was born in Israel. As I said, she is a doctor. She has a PhD in Jewish education. And Dr. Korazim has vast experience in Jewish education in Israel, the US, Canada, Latin America, and Europe. And I just want to remind you that uh, throughout the course of the program, uh, if you're watching on the Facebook channel of the Hartman Institute or on our website, you can send questions for Dr. Korazim that I will read at the end of her pr presentation. And um, in this interactive world, if you have comments to make during the uh, Facebook, during the program as well, you're free to do so on Facebook. We are watching you, so uh, be polite and uh, be um, germane to the point. Uh, without any further ado then, I'd like to turn the program over to Dr. Rachel Korazim. Thank you very much, and Boker Tov, Tzohoraim Tovim, Erev Tov, wherever you might be in the world. It's wonderful to be able to look at text together and study together. I do hope you have your text in front of you in whatever form of media, hard cover, a hard copy, or on any of the screens that you may be using. Those of you who studied with me may know, and the others will find out, how much I love to teach about things related to Israel, related to Judaism through modern Israeli poetry. The title for our session tonight, this morning, Hailaila Hazeku Lo Shira, on this night, it's all poetry, is inspired by a publication that appeared in Israel, I'm going to say some three or four years ago, with the same name. It has a collection of modern Israeli poetry relating to the event of the Passover Seder. When I started working about this session, I thought I will draw much more than I ended up doing a, from that particular anthology, but I still want to give them the kavod they deserve for the beautiful title of Halayla Hazeku Lo Shira, uh, this night it's all about Shira. And let's, without further ado, as you guys say, and I'm using my PowerPoint, but I'm going to cut it short, and we will start with Hamutal Bar Yosef. With every, each one of the poems on your handouts today, I'm trying to focus on a separate title. And with Hamutal Bar Yosef, who is a professor of literature emerita by now from Ben Gurion University, a pretty well-published poet poetess here in Israel. A lot of her work was and is translated into English. Some of it is available on the internet as well. I'd like to tell those of you who are into these things that it's thanks to Hamutal Bar Yosef that we can enjoy through her translations into Hebrew some of the recent Russian written Israeli poetry by uh, immigrants from the different waves from the former Soviet Union, but that's for another session. Hamutal Bar Yosef, through like all creative people, oftentimes draws on her experience. And if you turn your attention to page two of your handouts, we are looking at a poem called in Hebrew, Sheur Zehut, identity class. And the translation is always tricky because I think when you say in English identity, you may mean 
a lot of things, and when I hear in Hebrew Zehut or Zehut Yehudit, it's immediately taking me into this arena of classical Israeli conversations. So what are you more a Jew or an Israeli? What are you first? Who are you? What's your identity? And I think Hamutal by Yosef is having a conversation with her. Note, please, the tone which is retrospective. She's going to talk about experiences of the early years of the State of Israel, which have been mine as well. I, like Hamutal by Yosef, grew up on a kibbutz, so I can totally relate to the experience here. Let's read through some of it. I do not have the luxury of time to give both Hebrew and English tonight, so we'll do just the English. I'm from here. My parents were born in Gola, exile. They call the Jewish state Geula, and I'm grateful to the translator that did not attempt to translate Gola and Geula, but kept the sound, the closeness of sound between Gola exile and Geula redemption, or just Geula will do for us, and how close they are in Hebrew. I was born to the square Hebrew, upright, hungry, listen to the description of, of the harshness of some of the Ivrit maybe as compared to the Yiddish, maybe as compared to some Slavic languages. Hebrew is very, very harsh, okay? That was a good reason to be proud because you did everything in Ivrit in those early years. I was born in a kibbutz. I walked barefoot. For good and for better, we grew up like brothers. The girls with the boys, the happy times with the fears. A hint of Hamutal Bar Yosef that will not allow us to go too nostalgic on that one. It wasn't all that great. And although she's not going to go into the detail about the less than great moments of that time, she wants for us to remember not to go too soft and, and, and too nostalgic on that one. In our kibbutz, there was no synagogue. But Erev Shabbat, and again, thank you, translator, for keeping Erev Shabbat and not the eve of Shabbat, was a different time, special. After a warm shower, we were all dressed in white shirts that had arrived all ironed from the communal laundry. There are lots of other Israeli poetry that relate to the way of welcoming Shabbat, not necessarily through a liturgy and prayer, but through the custom of the kibbutz and the luxury of once a week of hot water, hot shower, which is very much the language of kibbutz of those early years. And now we come to Pesach. And on Erev Pesach, we reap the new wheat. What? Did you not clean the house? Did you not rush to synagogue? Did you not prepare nice tables and think about more questions for the Haggadah? No, the whole kibbutz experience, the focus of Pesach is on the Omer. And the reaping of the first wheat, we are back to an agricultural situation. The new Jew is born. The Haver, member of kibbutz, who played the great Kohen, had asked, did the sun set? And we all responded, it did, it did. And he asked again, shall I reap? And we all responded, ktsor, ktsor, reap, reap. And now, if you want to think, and God forbid you should, that Chabutal Bar Yosef, echoing the kibbutz experience of the time, are thinking of something totally a new invention. Of course, on the slide, and of course, as part of your sources, you can find the total quote, and thank you, Ori Meir, my son, for finding this very quickly for me, that everything that Hamutal Bar Yosef, echoing the kibbutz experience, is doing in this poem, is showing us how much the new Jew relied not only on biblical stories, but also on the Mishnah from Menachot number 10, page three, and you can all look it up. I only gave you the English on the screen, although we did have both, but Alan th thought that my slides were too crowded, so we did only the English for that one. Let's continue. And we, uh, all right, and we all responded, reap, reap. Then we gathered to celebrate the Seder, and we were all together. We did not think that 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 we had done was Jewish. We did not think that it was a good reason to be proud. Look at this in, inner intimate conversation with the title of the poem. What exactly is identity? 
What exactly is Jewish identity? What exactly is Israeli identity? So what were you doing in the kibbutz at the time? Well, were you doing Jewish stuff? Nah, we did kibbutz stuff. We did Israeli stuff. The language is different. And if you are going to do something with this poem, this is a good opportunity for you to see and to show, if you're going to use some of this in your teaching, how the modern Israel that so much aspired to be new were actually going back to the sources and not being that no eh, at all. Okay, so let us continue. I'm from here. Most women light Shabbat candles here. Look again, just like she did with the nostalgia at the beginning, she's trying to describe Israel to you, but she dis will describe it very honestly. Most of the women light Shabbat candles here. And I will add, most of the Fridays. Some of us, <coughs> not always, but we do that. For a whole week, every year, it is hard to get bread in most places. If you live in Jaffa, it's pretty easy. But that's another story, and this is where I live. One day a year, a desert silence paralyzes most of traffic. Two days a year, the sound of siren is a fire score heart wrenching. I'd like to stop here. Because when you live outside of Israel, I do know that you celebrate and commemorate Yom HaShoah. I've been there and will be there with you again. I do know that as close as you can to the Day of Independence, you will mark the Memorial Day for the soldiers fallen in the wars, and you will mark your Matzimot more or less on the date. But when you live in Israel, the sequence from finding it hard to find bread, moving into the two days of the siren, namely Yom HaShoah and Yom Matzimot, it's the beginning of the spring Yamim Noraim, if you wish, in Israeli society that start with Pesach, end of Pesach, soon Yom HaShoah, after that, Yom Ma'ut. So for the Israeli audience, very much like the three weeks of Tishrei, we are very, very conscious of the three weeks starting at Nisan and working their way into Iyar pretty soon. Not a big people, not numerous, living in a Jewish state, the only one we had loved and will love. It's a quote from an Israeli song. And whatever it is worth for good and for better, it is a good reason to be proud, even now. I think that sums up APAC pretty much for you guys. So yes, there's still stuff that we can be proud of. And as we are done with Hamutal Bar Yosef, and if you have comments or questions, please send them in as we are turning the page to page number three to Amnon Ribak. So if I could say very, very easily and very comfortably, that Hamutal Bar Yosef is pretty well-known poet in Israel. I cannot say the same about Amnon Ribak. He is not, has not published that much. He is not as well-known in the country. And yes, this particular poem, Kol Adam Tzarich Mitzrayim, Every Person Needs to Have a Certain Egypt. I love the translation here as well. Amnon Ribak is an educator. He works mainly out of the Midrasha in Oranim, up north in Israel. And I think the first person, at least as best as I know, Chaver Knesset Ori Orbach of Blessed Memory, who died a few years ago, uh, he's the one who at least brought it to my attention, this particular poem, and, and made it famous in the country, but it was later picked up by Israeli radio, announcer in one of the programs, so you can see it a lot of time. I would like to place this particular poem as I am doing my different topics under which we are looking at Israeli poetry related to the Seder. So if Chabutal Bar Yosef came for me, under the title of the new Jew having a conversation with very old ancient texts, I would like to go to a, a Amnon Ribak with a different topic, and that's the personal checklist. Why don't we, I read in Amnon Ribak's poem, every person needs to have a certain Egypt, why don't we use the Seder, which in Hebrew also means order of things, 
why don't we go through the motions of the Seder, the different steps to create our own separate checklist of things that mean for us exodus, things that mean for us a freedom, liberty, slavery, etc. So note, first of all, of course, as it is my custom, and all those of you who have studied with me know that I will never miss an opportunity to use the oldest trick in Jewish education and that guilt, and let you feel as guilty as possible for not having Ivrit, and I will take the opportunity with this particular poem. Every person needs to have a certain Egypt. So look at the point that before we talk about leaving Egypt, before we talk about exodus, before we are talking about liberating yourself, you need to have an Egypt. The need to be that point that you need to recognize in yourself that you will need to leave. And therefore, you can start with the first question, what is your Egypt? What is the place in which you are right now that you would like to be liberated from, to be able to leave? And then comes the English mundane to deliver themselves from, which in no way can compete with the Hebrew original, Lihiyot Moshe Atzmo Mitocha. Because Moshe, the Hebrew original for Moses, is in Hebrew also a verb of delivering, taking out of the water. And this is why Moshe is named thus because min meshitihu, because I was delivering him, bringing him out of the water. And the English translation totally uses this. So everyone needs to have a certain Egypt to be able to limshot, to make yourself a Moses by coming out of it with a strong arm, with grinding teeth. It's not always beyad chazaka. Sometimes the delivery is grinding teeth. Not mentioned in the Haggadah, I know that. But when you do your personal check list, then then. Every person needs terror and great darkness and comfort and promise of redemption. Look how he ties for us the, the horrible parts of the Egypt story. Those moments of terror will, will let go. What will happen? first and second and fourth, etc., all the way to the 10 different makot. We, we need that fear. We need to be able to have a moment of fear. We need to be able to have so that we can experience after that the promise of redemption. That they would know to look up at the sky. Every person needs one prayer, tefillah that would always be on their lips. The Haggadah is long. Wouldn't that be a great opportunity for you to choose from the whole text cover to cover that one prayer of the story of the delivery from Egypt that you really would like to have in your heart, that you would really like to have on your lips? A person needs to bend once. You cannot straighten up if you have not bended before. Every person needs a shoulder. Every person needs to have a certain Egypt to redeem themselves from, from the house of slavery. Look at the double. Mi mena, mi bet avadim. From it, from the house of slavery. To get out in the middle of the night to the desert of fears. Did you ever have an experience like that when you needed to leave a place in a hurry? Go into the unknown. Think about generations in your family. Think about no immigrants in your society now who had with all faith and trusting in a future to live in the middle of a night, whether symbolic or real, and trust themselves into the sea of fear. To get out in the middle of the night to the desert of fear, to march straight into the waters, to see them open on both sides. Wow! Like, can you really see yourself at the place when you are ready to st that the gate will be open, that the water will be split in two? And now look at this last one, because I think this one, to me at least, when I do my personal checklist, this is a very, very strong and important point in this particular poem and ties me also to the previous one, to the Chamutal Bar Yosef one. And that's what we will find now in the last stanza. 
every person needs a shoulder to carry the Joseph bones. This is part of the exodus of Egypt. We know the story that Joseph had died and, and, and was buried in Egypt, but he had commanded us to remember him and carry him all the way back to El Israel. When you go into a new journey, when you start a new step of liberation, what's your Joseph bones? What are you carrying on your shoulder from the past all the way to the new place? all the way to the, through the sea of tears. What is that particular element that you would like to redeem from your past that you know you ought to carry with you because a promise was made in your name 400 years earlier and you still remember it and carry it. Every person needs to straighten their back after they bended to put the Joseph stones. Every person needs to have a certain Egypt and a Jerusalem, and one long journey that they will remember forever in their feet souls. And now here is your tie-in and back again to the new Jew and back again to the end of the journey. It's nice to be able to recognize the place you have to leave. But what's the purpose of the whole exercise if you do not know what your goal is? So in this particular place, yes, this is an Israeli poem, and therefore the, point, the place you leave is Egypt, and your goal is Jerusalem. But I am inviting you to use this particular modern text that is having a conversation with the Haggadah to define your own checklist, your own fears, your own hope in an opening sea, your own bones of Joseph on your shoulder, and your own goal for the journey. And we are going to leave I'm not way back with that. And again, I'm inviting you to note down your questions, etc. Ha! You set me Mitzrayim. Let me. I hope you are also aware of the fact that we are having a PowerPoint presentation. It will not be a Rachel Korozim lesson if it did not have a PowerPoint presentation. We always have them. So here is another introduction for you of Hagit Akerman. And if we have used Hamutal Bar Yosef for the new Jew, and if we have used Amnon Ribak for the personal checklist, why do we not uh, rely on Chagit Ackerman, less famous again than Hamutal Bar Yosef, and then the coming Yehuda Michai and Alterman that sh we shall be reading, but bringing to the conversation that which has become pretty common in recent years in Israel, and that is to have we always had the tradition from the beginning of the Zionist settlement here in Eretz Israel of having the Kibbutzim Haggadot. We will see throughout the ages political Haggadot, alternative Haggadot for Pesach, and for the last few years also very feminist Haggadot. And Chagit Ackerman, also from the Midrasha in Oronim, is one of the people who have been involved <coughs> in creating a feminine and feminist Haggadot. And uh, in the collection that I have mentioned in the beginning, Halayla Hazeh Kulo Shira, you will find a few such poems. And I have chosen only one called Yotzet Mi Mitzrayim. And again, translation will be using it, losing something, because getting out of Egypt has no gender to it, because the English language does not attribute gender to the usage of verbs, but the Hebrew does. And the Hebrew title, therefore, is very clearly female, which is totally lost in the English. So please note the yotzet, the tough at the begin, uh, at the title, even if your Hebrew is not that fluent, please note the first word in the Hebrew in the title and the last letter in that, the tough indicates the feminine form. So it's about a woman, a leaving Egypt. It's about a feminist exodus. And look how I just need for you to look at the structure of the Hebrew. Look at the right hand side of your Hebrew text and look how all the first lines start with velo, 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 velo. So the tone of this feminist poem of exodus is a tone of negation. And a sort of a having a, a, a negation conversation, maybe with the 
male form of telling the story. This is not how I, the woman, is going to leave Egypt. This is something else, and therefore, velo, velo, velo. Not with a strong arm. Lo beyad chazaka. And not with an outstretched, or not, not with a strong hand. And not with an outstretched arm. And not with great awe. And not with signs. And not with wonders. So all the first part is literally a very direct quote from the Agada, Hagada, but adding a negation. So the whole feminist conversation here starts with, can we say after one, two, three, four, five, six times, no, that there is a sense of anger, that there is a sense of talking back at. It's not how I perceive my own exodus. My own exodus does not need all that physical strength. I don't need the big hand and the outstretched arm and the fear and the oh, no, 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 calm down. It's going to be a totally different language, rather hesitantly, with small stepped, steps, terrified by darkness, softly, dedicated, purposefully, with accuracy and love. Can you even hear through the translation the music of softness, the music, the strong voice of silence? Lo beroach veloko besheket, with silence, but knowing who you are and therefore being more accurate because maybe with the big signs and the big miracles and the awe and the big hand and the outstretched arm, you lose something of who you are. Too much noise there in the Haggadah for Hagit Ackerman. She is calling for introspection. She is calling for a different tone, for a different kind of exodus. And after all the negations, like each one of the negations is matched with one of those softer words, hesitant, small step, soft dedicated, purposeful, accuracy, love. Carrying little signs like the wrinkles of passing time, the transformation of seasons, my changing body, the pearls of my longing. Getting out of Egypt, Yotzet mi Mitzrayim, the poem closes in Hebrew just like it starts, just like it's like between these two if you want bindings of a book, covers of a book that hold the whole story together. And had I done the translation, I would have had a dilemma if calling both the title, literally, Yotzet Mi Mitzrayim, carrying with it the feminine form, because so much, at least at the end, I just wanted the word Exodus. Like getting out of there, Yetziat Mitzrayim, the classic. But this is not what Hagit Ackerman had opted to do, and I'm not the writer of the poem, just a reader of it. So I added the word exodus in parentheses to tell you that this is exactly what we mean. So with Hagit Ackerman, we were looking at a very contemporary, now kind of poetry, Israel of recent years, and therefore we need to go to page Five. I'm sort of deliberating between the two, but yes, I will start with five with you, Da Michai. Hirhurei Lel Hasidir. Reflection on Seder night, but the word Hirhur in Hebrew has this sense of a little bit of onomatopoeic. There is something in the sound of it that thinks about thinking about stuff, letting sort of a windy sounding type of word, hirhur, during Lel Seder. You want to know that this particular poem that we are reading by Yudha Michai comes from the last collection, anthology of Yudha Michai that was published in his lifetime. And that's open, close, open. Patuach, Segur, Patuach. This about five years before Amichai 
passes away, it's 1995 or 96, the date of publication. So we are dealing here with a very mature, I would say, aged type of Amichai poetry, looking back at his years, thinking about experiences, allowing himself maybe some cynicism, some critique, here and there maybe some bitterness seeps through. So I want you to think, and I actually, I could have chosen maybe a more aged picture of Amichai now that I come to think about it. But this is like really the last book appearing in Amichai's lifetime that we have. Here, Hurei Leil HaSeder. Reflections on Seder night. Manishtana, we ask, and again, Thank you, translators, for keeping the Manishtana in the original. This is the way we need it, and I hope we all recognize it. How is this night different from all other nights? How changed? And again, look at the subtlety and the sensitivity of Amichai, who knows that his readership may not pay attention to the double meaning because we use the expression manishtana, and the way we answer it is, how is this night different from other nights? But this is not the only meaning of the Hebrew expression. The double meaning, manishtana mi lelot achirim, how is it different from other nights? But manishtana on itself, what changed? What had happened? Makara. And Amichai wants for us to be aware of the double meaning of the expression. Most of us are grown up now and have stopped asking because we always let the younger ones ask and they are the ones asking at the table. But some go on asking all their lives. The way one asks, how are you? Or what time is it? And keep on walking. Oh, stop with Amichai here. Are you ready to go into the Seder this year and coming years, not with that sort of, you know, eh, we'll do the Seder as we have always done. And we are not really mindful when we ask the question and we know exactly what the answers will be. And Amichal says, no, 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 don't do that. Like you find somebody on the street and you say, Manish mind, they don't really care what they will answer. You just want to go on. No, let's do it differently. Manishtana kol laila. What changes every night? How changed is every night? Like an alarm clock whose ticking is soothing and so horrific. Manishtana hakol yishtane. Everything will change. What has changed? All shall be changed. Change is God. Here's your classical Amichai sort of stepping out of his own poem and making a comment about his own writing. Okay, change, actually change is divine, change is God. Reflections on Seder night. Of four sons does the Torah speak, one wise, one wicked, one simple, and one, and one who knows not how to ask. And Amichai recites for us the classical four sons. And unlike feminist poetry, he is not calling for four daughters. He is calling for another lacuna, something else that he is missing. We have so learned to identify the four sons at the Seder table. But something now that I am older, something now is missing. But nothing is said there about a good one or a loving one? And that's a question that has no answer. Have we missed something? Are we missing something by not including in the way we look at our society, at our family, at the better, the other, the softer characteristics? How about a good son? How about a loving son? Do they not deserve a place at the table? And if there were an answer, I wouldn't want to know. I who had passed through all the faces of the sons. Remember an early Amichai? 
I who have climbed all the hills, who came down, who carried my brothers, Avichai, is going back clearly to a verbatim quote of his own poem from, I'm going to say, at least 40 years before this one is published, describing himself. And now he's calling upon a different retrospection and looking at the Haggadah. The four sons are not necessarily four different people. I have been the four sons. I, in different phases of my life, have been the different sons. Again, I call upon us for a different reading of the Haggadah. How about when you recite that part of the Haggadah, you look inside you and say, when have I been the smart one? When have I been the wicked one? In what phases of my life did I not know how to ask the proper question? A very interesting call of Amichai. I who had passed through all the phases of the suns in their changing constellations, I've lived my life. The no moon shed its light on me for no reason. The sun went on its way. The Passovers passed without an answer. Manishtana. What has changed? Change is God. Death is his prophet. I did not necessarily wanted you or wanted to leave you with the gloomy part of this poem. And I've started off by saying this is an aging Amichai. This is Amichai who is ready to evaluate his life. And you can look at it that way. I'm not necessarily calling you to use the Seder as a point of summing up your life. But it's a good point to stop and maybe pick some of the suggestions of not just doing it matter of fact, of really listening to the answers, of thinking of other spaces that we need to recognize in our families, such as the good son, the loving son, but also looking introspectively into who we are and asking ourselves where in what phases of our life have we played or been part of the different options of the sons. So the four sons of the Haggadah as actually phases of life. And I'm really going to congratulate myself for leaving enough time, the last five or six minutes of this, for reading, and you know that if you know a little bit about me already, about Nathan Alterman. So this one I really went a long way, and this, like many of Alterman poems, unfortunately, does not have an official translation. So this is a homemade Rachel Korozim translation, and I as always welcome corrections addendums, ideas of better doing that, and I promise to include them in future teaching. I'd like to read this first and then tell you something about it. Hagdi min ha And again, gdi and hagada in Hebrew, you have the sound connection, and the gdi and the hagada are using the same Hebrew letters, which the translation, unfortunately, cannot render for you. The kid from the hagada. He stood there in the market among she-goats and billy-goats, swinging its tail, as small as a pinky, a kid from a poor home, a kid for two coins, two zuzim, with no adornments, no bell, and no ribbon. Alterman loved markets, and lots of his poetry has market pictures in it, market descriptions. And for him just to be able to see this little kid standing there, and he is actually starting the Chadgadia before Abba ever came to buy the Gdi. Alterman is going into the picture before the Chadgadia poem will start and says, hang on, before Abba ever got there to buy the kid, he was already, or it was already standing there, just a regular, simple little gdi. Nobody paid attention, and no one knew. Neither the goldsmith nor the wool combers, the people on the market, that this kid will enter the Haggadah and will be the hero of a song. You know, it, it, it's a classical alterman to visualize a pre Haggadah reality. There was a time that nobody knew that we will have a poem like this. And now we take it for granted, but hello, it must have been born on a certain day. And on that day, nobody yet knew. 
But dad approached with light on his face and bought the kid and caressed its forehead. And this was the start of one of the songs that we will be sung forever. Abba actually just went there. Was he thinking about his son or daughter or anybody? Uh, we don't know. But this ended up being the story that we will sing forever. The kid had licked, licked dad's hand with its tongue and touched it with his wet nose. This brother, Achi, was the first rhyme, rhyme for which the verse is the Zabin Abba that father bought. This was what actually happened. And then the poet came and gave it words. It was a spring day and the wind was dancing. Girls were laughing with blinking eyes. And dad and the kid entered the Haggadah and just stood there both. That very same Haggadah was already full with wonders and great miracles. Therefore, they stood on the last page, hugging and pressed to the wall. You know, the Haggadah has so much stuff in it. And let's be honest, Chavirim, says Alterman, how many of us do read it to the end? And how many of us, you know, after dinner we stop and start skipping parts of the Haggadah? So the Haggadah was so crowded. It had so much stuff that Abba <coughs> and the kid had to take the only available place, and that was the last page. That very same Haggadah was already full with wonders and great miracles. Therefore, they stood on the last page, hugging and pressed to the wall. The very same Haggadah then silently said, OK, stand there, kid and dad. In my pages, smoke and blood are walking. I'm talking of greatness and secrets. Yet I know that the sea will part for a reason. There is sense in breaking through walls and deserts. If at the end of the tale, a father and a kid are waiting for their turn to shine. Look at Alterman. Taking upon himself the responsibility to talk in the name of the Haggadah, in the name of the Higadeta, and he is saying, it's great to talk about miracles. It's great to talk about deliverance from Egypt. It's great to mention the parting sea. But hello, the whole purpose of the exercise is the knowledge that at the end there is Abba and there is a kid and there is a story of love. What I wanted to share with you and to conclude with for today is that this poem was written Erev Pesach, 1944. And you know, those of you who have studied Alterman the Seventh Column with me, I always describe to you how that used to be published on every Friday in the VAR. And I try to describe for you how you sit in Tel Aviv in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s when Alterman is still writing, and you are waiting for your Friday paper, and you open it with a cup of coffee, and if it's the 40s, you are still allowed a cigarette. And then you say, oh, I wonder what Alterman wrote this week. And you know what I did? I allowed myself this privilege today, this afternoon before I came. And I went to the internet site of old Israeli journalism, and I looked up the date of Erev Pesach 1944, and it was a Friday. And I looked on the screen on the page thinking, Pesach 1944. It's a year after the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. It's three weeks after Hungary, the last living community of Jews in Europe, is being invaded by the Nazis and the beginning of the Hungarian Jewish Holocaust. And Alterman, like many a poet, can think ahead with a prophetic voice. And you see, these big challenges will end. And when they do, Will you remember our priorities? They are all about the continuation of life. 
I'm going to conclude here, although I do have another text for you, and I do not think that you need me to remember that, but it's there for you to look at in your sources, and that's the famous story about Ben-Gurion giving testimony to the Committee of the UN on Palestine, and it was 1947 when he told that famous story about the difference between the male flower story and the Passover story. So I figured for the 70th anniversary of the event, you might as well look at this text again. Thank you very much for being with us that long, and we will entertain some questions maybe. Yes, mm -hmm. that, was, that was a great presentation. In fact, uh, I, of course, throughout it, I tried to avoid using the asking the question, Manish Tanaha Laila Zeb, because that's probably a cliche, but certainly this night, how different this night, this program has been for many others to focus on such remarkable poetry. And I think all of, many of us, myself included, will have things to add to the Haggadah. You say it's long, but maybe it will, the Seder will be even longer because I see almost every poem where I would say, wait a second, everybody, stop. Let's <laughs> dig into a poem for a few minutes before we go on to the next thing, and even up to and including the very end, uh, Chad Gadya. Um, and we'll come back to the Ben-Gurion thing in one minute. So we do have a few questions. And the first one, first of all, uh, you did mention a few times um, that there were other translators. And so just so everybody out there is um, to answer a question several people have asked is that will you provide us with the names of the translators and we will make that available to them as well. So everybody wants I to know who translates. No, of, no, of I course. A classical Amichai would be the Chanaz, Chana Bloch, and Chana Kornfeld. No, no, we, but I, I will try to we look will for get, them. We will yeah. put it on, we'll create an updated version of the source document with the names of the translators and including the one that you yourself translated. Okay. So I have a really nice, a really interesting question. Besides, first of all, many people said how remarkable and how wonderful this presentation was. Thank you. Um, so those are really not questions, but they were praised to you. Here's a question, that in fact, taking us maybe to the next step. And this is from Erwin um, Zeplowitz, who's rabbi of the Community Synagogue in Port Washington on Long Island in New York. Mm -hmm. And he writes, as if apparently he hasn't had enough. Are there poems you might suggest, as you alluded to in your remarks, which speak to the theme of Pesach as a paradigm of revolution and resistance? Thank you, as always, for such a wonderful seminar and rich materials. So Rabbi Zeppelitz hasn't even had enough with these. He wants even more. So to uh, try and accommodate him, maybe I'll put you on the spot um, at the top of your head, a poem or two that, he, that would focus on those issues uh, about uh, Pesach as a holiday of revolution or resistance, at least. I think that I, nothing comes from the top of my head right now. There must be, and I am ready to look for them. I can tell you that, as always, when I prepare such sessions, I had many, many more poems that I was looking through before I chose the ones for our session. I would say, like from the top of my head, that poems that look at Pesach as an opportunity to look at rebellion, resistance, etc., with the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising being on Erev Pesach, my natural instinct would be to go to Haggadot that were written in the DP camps, to look at Haggadot that were written in the Kibbutzim in the early years. Unfortunately, not many available in English, but I promise you that I will be looking for some, and if I can email you some and you can put it on your internet site, then yes, I will do that work as soon as tomorrow morning. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, here's another question that just came in off our Facebook page. Jonathan Freund, he says, Rachel, do you see any parallel or contrast between the father and the kid and the Akedah? A classical, but can we let ourselves just for once to let go of the Akedah <laughs> and let a father hug a kid and bring him to his son as a gift and nobody being binded and nobody dying and nobody losing anything, just hugging and loving. I was making in Amichai's name a call for the son with a lot of love, for the son with understanding and beauty. Yeah, father, kid, la 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 la, akeda, classic. It's always there at the back of our minds. I'm calling for a deep breath and just enjoying that beautiful hug that somebody created 
for the Alterman poem and I found on the internet with the licking and the hugging and the touching and no, nothing bad happening at this very moment. I hope you can live with that. Okay, another uh, more uh, practical question from Suzanne Singer who asks for the, the source from the Mishnah for the Hamatal Bar Yosef story that you mentioned. So it was in the presentation and I think the presentation is available. We'll make it available on the and, website. And yes. I'm repeating again and since Uri, my son, found it on the internet, so can you. It's in Menachot 10.3. It's there. So you can find it relatively easily and it's on this site. Yeah. Code 10-3. Mm -hmm. We have a few minutes left. Um, let me ask a question then. So you mentioned uh, both um, uh, classic, uh, the ha classic Haggadah and you talked about many of the different Haggadot that have been created both in, in Israel and in pre-state Palestine in the Warsaw Ghetto. How, how do we deal with all the different Haggadot out there? Can we, do we lose something from the original Haggadah when everybody wants to bend the Haggadah to their, to their particular experience at their particular time? Or is the Haggadah something designed to be so elastic and open that we can all add or, frankly, subtract, as you also referenced to it throughout the course of a Seder or many years? I think that I would go much more with the, the end part of the way you phrase your question. The Haggadah in itself is a compilation. We know that particular and different parts of it have been added in different periods, like, for example, the songs after Bikat Amazon and after Lishana Ba'abi Yerushalayim, when we have all those songs that we, we, we know some have been added in the Middle Ages and later periods. <coughs> I think that the freedom that we are experiencing, mainly so in recent years, both in Israel, in North America, and in other places, to go back to the Haggadah, maintain a lot of the classical text, but add more questions, offer more opportunities, offer some modern poetry to be involved in it. I, for many years, have treated modern Israeli poetry as per relating to things of our Jewish life, of our state life, of our everyday life here, as a different level of midrashim, as they are coming back to read biblical stories in a different way. So why not? Why not let the Haggadah be something dynamic? And in all fairness, like, do we really ever do it fully, cover to cover, without skipping a word, without adding a tone, tune, without telling something about what grandpa used to do and what grandma used to do and what made you nervous and what was fun as you were growing up, etc. I think we have always, at least in the circles where I grew up with, I was born on a kibbutz and I spent my first years in kibbutzim and occasionally I've been invited to kibbutzim. Let me tell you that in my home, we do the full Haggadah. We try not to skip anything. We continue with all the songs after the Shana Babi Yerushalayim. And then we have our own brochure of songs that we sing at the Seder table. And I think most of the family, and especially the children, yes, they do enjoy the Afikoman and all that and the Manishtana, but everybody is waiting for the Shira B'tzibor, the classical Israeli sing-along at the end of the Haggadah. This is my particular Seder. Okay, we have uh, one, a few more questions. I think we may have time for only one of them. And so anyone who's asked a question we didn't get to, I will apologize in advance. So this is from Rabbi Michel Misagia, and again, I also apologize if I didn't get your name right, from Temple Israel of Hollywood um, in, oh, La in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. um, and she writes, in the poem by Chagit Eckerman, when she writes, Caring Little Signs, mm -hmm. is she suggesting that this is in contrast to the Israelite tribes in the desert who carried flags as they marched during the 40 years of wandering. Is she trying to uh, contrast or uh, reference that uh, as well, you think? Maybe, maybe. My reading was different. I thought that carrying little signs was Chagit's conversation with all the schlepping we always 
connect to the whole idea of leaving Egypt. They had to pack and the bread and the this and this and hurry and they were carrying this and carrying that and now you mentioned the flags and she wants to do all the velo, velo, velo. So she doesn't want to think about everything that women had to carry at the time and men. She wants to talk about her own exodus and therefore caring, being aware of the changes in your body and the little signs that go with delivering yourself and doing your own exodus. That was my own reading, but as always, I'm ready for any invitation to go back to the text and reconsider. So your reading is as kosher as mine, Michelle. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rachel. I want to uh, say we're about to wrap up, and um, as uh, Rachel didn't go in great detail into the Ben-Gurion quote, it is something for you to work on and to live with until about a month from now when we will visit the issue of Yom Hatzma'ut <coughs> with Dr. Ruth Calderon, and I can tell you now for the first time uh, that what the title of that program will be, and the title she will, that she will use for her program is The Israeli Identity Challenge, once again, issues of identity, mm -hmm. public sphere in a, the, the public sphere in a Jewish democratic state. That's April 25th, same time, on, your, on the website of the Hartman Institute and on our Facebook page and I believe also on our YouTube channel. I want to thank you again for You're a so remarkable welcome. presentation and uh, thank you everybody for staying with us. And as usual, we will be posting this on our website and on our YouTube channel for you to use not just this year, but for many years to come, we hope, and something fresh for you in your Seder this year. Thank you, and so long from Jerusalem. To Dalabali, Trope.